Welcome back, uh, Bishop Saro. Uh, so we'll go back to Chaldean situation right now in Iraq. Yes. Uh, obviously, uh, the Chaldean people in Iraq uh, constituted, until today, for the last several centuries, until today, constitute the largest, uh, by far, the largest uh, Christian uh, group in Iraq. Uh, and uh, believe it or not, Christianity in Iraq uh, was uh, the majority when Islam at the 7th century arrived into Iraq. Mm -hmm. According to uh, taxation records that the Abbasid uh, M, uh, Khalifat uh, maintained, uh, uh, they used to tax 64% of Iraqis in, in, in Iraq, they used to be taxed jizya mm -hmm. because they were non-Muslims. Non yeah. And these, that 64% constituted Christians because already six centuries mm -hmm. of Christianity flourished there. And also there were a lot of Jewish people mm -hmm. because the remnant of the 10 tribes that the Assyrians and Babylonians brought them to Iraq. So 64% of Iraq was non-Islamic. Uh, uh, many of them could have been Arabs, could have been Kurdish, could have been Assyrians, Babylonians, Chaldeans, different groups of people. But religiously, from that date, we see that Christianity in Iraq began to decline mm -hmm. for two reasons. One was the burdensome of tax that some people uh, came to the point that they said we cannot tolerate this taxation. So what happened was they abandoned Christianity in favor of becoming, uh, converting to Islam and in order to live normal life. And secondly was uh, the lack of uh, rights that uh, a Christian would have socially uh, in, in the Islamic society in Iraq. Uh, there were certain colors that they had to wear, certain way to travel, and sometimes they were discriminated against. Uh, so that made, and sometimes we had uh, rulers who were brutal uh, starting from the Persians before Islam and even during the Khalifat and the Ottoman uh, succession, especially uh, when it came in northern Iraq, the many massacres that we have undergone as Christian there. So from 64% in the 7th century, the Christian population today in Iraq Mm -hmm. the land of our forefathers has come down to one half of one percent. Wow. Yeah. It's a tragic situation. And the last blow was uh, when the regime in Iraq, uh, the Saddam Hussein regime, collapsed. Mm -hmm. The Christian population used to be 1.5 million for sure, more than one million Christian since 2003 had left Iraq. And this is truly, truly, this is not only a loss only for the Chaldeans and Assyrians mm -hmm. and, and the other Christian groups uh, now like the Syriacs, like the Armenians uh, who live there, and other religious minorities. Uh, we lost, true, first loss is ours. We lost because uh, we left uh, the land of our forefathers, our ancestral mm -hmm. land. Okay. No place can give rise to our kind of people like Iraq. Mm -hmm. For thousands of years, that land, like a beautiful tree, gave us like the fruit to the whole world. But I think the, the side that lost more than us are Iraqis themselves. 
because Christians are pacifist people. They are people who love peace, who are peaceful themselves, and who are hardworking, who are faithful to their uh, authorities, political authorities, uh, uh, and and we could be catalysts of education, of healthcare, uh, of teaching, as we have been for all these centuries. Uh, so uh, we feel very bad uh, that we have left, uh, and and uh, and we don't think we will have elsewhere an opportunity uh, to exercise our existence like we were in Iraq. So how do you see the future of Chaldean and Assyrian and Middle East? Honestly, as it is going now, it will be a matter, uh, it's, a, it's an avalanche effect. The more it goes, the bigger the problem becomes. Unless there is a rethinking in Iraq by the powers that govern there, by the powerful uh, majorities like the Shiites, the Sunni, the Kurds, when they themselves, their political leaders, maybe on their uh, popular level people, we coexisted as people of Iraq, all of us together uh, for years and years and years, centuries. But I think solution is in the hands of the political leaders. They have to realize uh, Christians are that glue that brings all sides together. It's a soft gelatin. Mm -hmm. And this expression is not mine. I borrowed it from another thinker, from another uh, uh, very... Uh, highly educated person who said uh, uh, it's like you put two bones together they they are differently shaped mm -hmm. it's not easy to put them unless you put uh, a joint of gelatin together then you see the two bones can not only be joined together but work together so the human body can walk yes, yeah. can function properly. And who are those two bones? Two bones could be the Shiites, the Sunni, the Kurds, mm -hmm. uh, and those who put people together mm -hmm. are the Christians. Yes. The Christians have the uh, capacity to be, uh, to be uh, a cell builders, a consensus builders because of their faith, of their neutrality, of their common sense, of their peace-loving attitude, mm -hmm. uh, because of their insight, because of the uh, religious insight that they have, because of their relationship with the West, that they can bring the best of the West, uh, just like... Uh, at some times we used to give all knowledge to the world, but today we need the knowledge and technology of the world that comes to us. So we can be agents of prosperity and agents of change in our own homeland. But unless we are given that opportunity uh, peacefully, because we can only live, Christians ha do not have the power to defend themselves. We are peaceful people. We need one and require one thing, and that is security. Mm -hmm. If we have security, I think Christian, many, you will see many Christian returning back, okay. and I wish that they will come. Because unless we continue, Iraq continues producing Chaldeans and producing Assyrians and producing Syriac people. When we come here, it's a matter of time mm -hmm. that we will uh, melt in these cultures, in these huge 
cultures that has uh, melted down many other groups, ethnic groups bigger than us. Uh, we mentioned you know, like at the very beginning that you were tr you left Iraq in 1973. Yes, and that was way you know it's like back before the 2003 war. And so, how was the situation at that time for Christian? You know, I think uh, my own family. I have family members who left the Iraq early 60s. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So there was some sense that some of us felt mm -hmm. as though hard times are coming up. Okay. I think it was after uh, uh, after the, the early decades of the Iraqi state mm -hmm. uh, and all the counter-revolutions -revolution, and counter-revolutions that began happening in Iraq, we sensed, because we are peaceful people, we can sense trouble from a very long distance. Mm -hmm. And sensing that trouble and these difficult time coming, many of us said, no, we cannot tolerate this. So they began leaving. And indeed, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. when I left already, there was a war between North and South for 10 years. Wow. Yeah. After me, 20, 30 years of war, non-stop in Iraq, war after yeah. war, after embargo, after a campaign, Gulf War One, Gulf War Two, and now the terrorism, fall of Saddam, then Daesh. It yeah. is if you subjugate a piece of iron to what Iraq and that region, Syria as well, mm -hmm. has have been subjugated to, that iron will be m melted 10 times. But we see, and I admire the resilience in the Iraqi people. I admire them. I have the greatest respect to true Iraqi spirit and people who really still want to live in peace uh, and in tranquility and in democracy. The problem is always what the politicians will do. That's true. So how do you, you know, like see the future of democracy in Iraq? That is also a very difficult question. Mm -hmm. uh, you see, and, and I will end my presentation to you with this insight. I think democracy as such is a Western civilization uh, phenomena. It, it took uh, centuries for Europe to come into the mentality and, and commitment to democracy. Mm -hmm. When at that time the, uh, the church, religion or church, uh, secularism and the state, the secular state and the early uh, maybe 16th, 17th century began uh, clashing with one another. There was a dialectic. There was a synthesis. The more they went, uh, they began affecting each other and reshaping what happened that democracy was the, the, the resultant of this interaction in Europe. Uh, uh, which for Churcher, who said democracy is an evil because it's the rule of the mob, mm -hmm. uh, uh, of, the, of the common man, but it is the best system that ever exists. Everything else is worse than it. So I think in, in the Middle East, to come and impose a Western value like democracy on these nations, it's doubtful. At best, it's doubtful. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what happened in Iraq, yes. for example. Mm -hmm. um, that's why I think uh, a native experiment, a local experiment, has to spring. Uh, and the dialectic would, should be between the religion of Islam and, and the authority of Qur'an 
uh, and between the secular, the nationalist people, they have to get into dialogue in order to develop mm -hmm. a peaceful way, whereas they can live in a secular state. You maintain religion, just like in the West. There is religion, there is state, but there is a separation between the two. Mm -hmm. The church cannot overcome and pre make prejudice against the state. I think peace in the Middle East, especially in our countries, cannot come until there is a peaceful existence between these two. And I think I encourage my Muslim brothers and sisters to seek the solution because the world needs to live in peace and peace no one can give us peace unless we, every person, works to bring peace to his own soul through a relationship, his relationship, her relationship with God. Unless I bring peace to my own family, no one will give me peace to my family. I have to work with my family members. Same thing in my community. I have to work with my community members. Same thing in the city. And the same principle applies in Iraq. We are responsible as Iraqis to bring that peace, to find ways to coexist, and to make sure peace does not come when minorities are persecuted. Because a chain that has many uh, 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 circle of, uh, of many pieces is as strong as its weakest link. So unless the Christians in Iraq that today constitute half of one percent, unless they live in peace, you will never see in peace and insecurity. You can never have a genuine peace existing and continuing in any country. That's true. Um, what is the situation of Chaldean Church in Canada? Now? In Canada, we are a small church spread out throughout Canada. We have 12 centers, mm -hmm. uh, mainly in Ontario. Yes. Uh, the biggest in Ontario is GTA here in Toronto. Uh, we are about 30,000 Chaldeans. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have uh, 11 priests who serve uh, this community, scattered community. Uh, there is one bishop, uh, 11 priests and 12 centers. Many of these centers have their own buildings. And we are uh, now beginning to organize ourselves. I'm the third bishop here. We had two bishops before me. Uh, uh, the late uh, Marhan Nazora, who passed away a few years ago, and the second bishop was uh, His Excellency Bishop Emmanuel Shalita, who was transferred. Now he's the bishop in California. Uh, now uh, I'm following their footstep and working on the program that we have in our parishes. Basically, we like to strengthen the individual. Uh, teach, continue teaching the Christian faith, the Bible values, the church teaching, especially to the children and to the young people, because they are going to be the adults of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And if they have the correct thinking, and basically in Christianity, our philosophy can be summed up in two concepts. You have to really have a love for something that is bigger than you. You cannot, yourself cannot be the most important thing in your life. And this is what we say, I worship God. It means, in Christian terms, it means I am a person that I believe in something that is bigger than me. And that person who is God his rules, his vision, his guidance, I attribute to it. I follow it. I make it my own. 
and I faithfully live according to it. So that's, we try to instill this idea in the mind and heart of our people, younger people. The older people, either they have it or they don't. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay? But our target is the young people. Number two, uh, as a result of loving God, for you to know if someone really loves God and have faith in God and worship God, you see how does he treat other people. And we are called as Christians to love everyone, including those people who do not love us, including those people who are our enemies, including those people who persecute us. In fact, for them, we have to pray and ask God to correct their thinking and make them good people so that they are pleasing to God as we are. Uh, Bishop Sara, what's your relation with the Pope? Uh, the relation of the Chaldean Church uh, with uh, His Holiness the Pope of Rome is uh, like any other uh, church, uh, Oriental Church, that is Catholic. We are Catholics. Mm -hmm. uh, the Catholic uh, Chaldean Church is divided into uh, many uh, regions. Each region is governed by, is administered, is served by one bishop. Mm -hmm. That bishop reports to a patriarch who is the head of all the Chaldean bishop. And today's patriarch is uh, his beatitude uh, patriarch and cardinal Marlouis Sacco, who lives in Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, we attribute, uh, we uh, adhere to set of rules, of liturgy. We have uh, the same mentality and teaching. Uh, we try to live in unity and in charity as uh, members of the same church. But the Catholic Church has many churches like us. All these churches, which like the Chaldean, the Maronite, the Syrian Catholic, the Greek Catholic, the uh, Armenian Catholic, the Coptic Catholic, there are about 20 Eastern Catholic churches. They all adhere, each one on its own, to the Pope. We also follow the rules and teachings that the Catholic Church teaches us in the person of the Pope. Mm -hmm. And we live a life of communion, of unity and charity and truth with all the Catholics in the world. The reason why we respect Rome and we respect the Pope because we believe Jesus established one church mm -hmm. and he did not establish many churches. He said one church and he asked St. Peter, he said he gave him, he asked him a faith question when he answered, he said, I make you the foundation of this church and upon you I will build my church. So uh, since Jesus' time, Peter and later on his successors, those who came after him, mm -hmm. those who received his responsibilities, and Peter died in Rome, mm -hmm. and the bishop who came after him and after him and after him and until today is Pope Francis, the early church always venerated them, and he was a symbol of unity. Uh, for example, I, a Chaldean, live in Toronto. If I go to, uh, to anywhere, to let's say to Chile, mm -hmm. uh, to a diocese, to a church in Chile, I feel united with that uh, Chilean person if he's Catholic, because his bishop mm -hmm. is also connected with the Pope okay. and my I and my patriarch are connected to the Pope mm -hmm. so we have that connectivity in faith in charity in communion and relationship and I think this is a wonderful thing that Christianity can actually be lived 
in all its dimensions. Absolutely. So we'll go a little bit, you know, like on the coat of arms. Yeah, you of, my, of the diocese. Of your, yeah. Yes, yeah. If you can explain to us, you know, what does it resemble? Yeah. And, Each yeah. bishop, uh, when he is first uh, given a responsibility, he's supposed to come up with a theme mm. in his mind and show it in art, uh, artistic way what is it that he wants to do, how he understands himself, mm -hmm. and what is it he wants to do in his ministry as a bishop. Yes. So uh, in my case, uh, I took a classic designation of a shield. This shield is like the shield that uh, yeah. a soldier would fight. This shield represents Canada, mm -hmm. the country of Canada, because mm -hmm. my diocese is all Canada. And uh, the leaf uh, uh, is right here. Mm -hmm. The maple leaf maple in leaf. color red is there. The M yeah. on the left represents mm -hmm. Mary, Saint Mary, the mother of Jesus, yes. our Lord and our God, the mother of God. And Yudhe, it's, it's uh, Aramaic uh, words, they represent the word Yahweh, mm. which is the name of God that was used in the Old Testament. The two blue parts of the shield represents the two oceans, oceans, uh, oceans of Atlantic and Pacific, mm -hmm. uh, and, and Canada is between them. So the Yudhe represent the Chaldean church that we come from the east. Mm -hmm. And Mary is protecting us as well. Because a few years ago, the Catholic bishops uh, of Canada dedicated all Canada to the protection of Mary. Mm -hmm. So I, as a Catholic bishop in Canada, liked to put uh, the name Mary. Mm -hmm. The mitre above represents the bishop, mm -hmm. myself, the cross, and the coiser. Cross is what we bless everything with it. He is the symbol of Christ in our lives. Mm -hmm. And the coiser is the sign of service and leadership of a bishop. The one thing I like to explain is the English text. Mm -hmm. uh, usually a bishop would take one verse, one line from either the Bible or one of the church books, and he would put it as a theme of his episcopacy. And I chose uh, a line that comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 15, verses 15, which is, I have called you friends which is exactly the words that Jesus tells his disciples. You're not my servants, you're not strangers, but you are my friends. So when we live a true relationship with Jesus, anybody, anybody in this world, when they live a true relationship with Jesus, they are elevated from normal people all the way to the friends of God. Absolutely. So this is, uh, I say to, my pe to myself first and then to the people, if God calls me a friend, who calls you a friend, who am I to look at you as my enemy? How can I? Wow. That's why we go back to the principle, if I really love God, I have to love everybody else. I thank the opportunity uh, for this conversation uh, with you. Thank you for your questions. Thank you very much for coming, actually. Uh, sure. Uh, it was such a rich, you know, it's like, uh, although it's like we'd love to have you for a longer time. Yes. But uh, hopefully we're <laughs> going to see you again. Yes. Thank you, you know, so much, Rada. Thank you very much. And I thank uh, uh, TAC TV and its uh, owner and personnel uh, and you very much uh, for conducting this interview. Thank you very much. Sure. And we'd like to thank uh, Bishop Bawai Soro for his contribution today with his rich, uh, I don't know, it's like it's 
not a lecture, it's not a documentary, but it's a long chat. It's lovely chat, actually. Thank and thank you very much. And up until next time, have a good night.